So, we are running a little bit behind schedule because Axel Voss uh, fantastically gave us more of his time than he thought he was originally able to, for which we are very grateful. Um, because, of course, he has unique insights uh, into the work of the Parliament and the Commission uh, related to AI. Um, so we are now about 20 minutes uh, behind schedule. We'll see whether we can catch up on some of this. But as you know, towards the end, um, we have a relatively long sort of informal drinks and networking session. So if we run a little bit into this, um, that shouldn't be a problem, hopefully, for anyone. Uh, session two uh, is... Uh, the Moonshot panel on what the Moonshot is actually about. And I'm very happy to have with me here five distinguished colleagues who I will introduce um, during the first round. Um, so we won't do this right now. I'll do this one by one as uh, I ask them the first question. Um, I guess you guys remember who I am, so I don't have to introduce myself, but I'm happy to moderate this panel. Very happy indeed. And I thought before we go um, into it, uh, I just remind us a little bit what this moonshot is about. And, and actually, David and I and some others worked uh, pretty hard on this, David, about half a year ago, right? Yeah, sure. Um, and so we, we struggled to come up with wording that would be worthy of the term moonshot. And the wording that we found in the end, so the core of this document, it says, the moonshot goal is that by the end of the decade, European citizens, industries, and public organizations have trustworthy European alternatives to the generative AI systems created outside of Europe, the ones that we currently see. And I want to emphasize the trustworthy part of that because, and I think we've heard this in the first session, these systems that we currently have are impressive, but trustworthy, they're definitely not. So this is not just about building something that others already have. It's about building something that's incredibly more powerful and useful and safer and more reliable and also more valuable than is currently available. And in fact, we know that right now, the big American companies also work very hard on you know, getting rid of hallucinations, making these systems more robust, uh, making them fairer without creating strange artifacts like Native American popes and things like this, mm -hmm. which we'd probably love to have, but haven't existed so far, right? Um, so it's not that they're not interested in these goals. They're very much interested in these goals, but they don't know how to get there. Just like the Soviets in the 60s didn't really know to get to the moon either. And our American friends had to make a huge effort to make that happen with a lot of technological innovation. So. That said, let's launch um, into it. So the first in our round here is David Bisset uh, from EU Robotics. Um, he's the executive director um, at EU Robotics uh, with 27 years of experience in robotics, blending academia and industrial expertise. So across this famous divide uh, with work spanning Europe and fostering innovation through projects such as the Rodin CSA and the DIH Hero. Um, David is majorly involved in shaping strategic partnerships and agendas, for instance, ADRA. Um, and he's a key figure in the UK's robotics growth partnership, as well as the core editor for the AI data and robotics partnership in the European Union. Welcome, David. It's truly a pleasure to have you. Thank you. So I, I'm wondering, David, you're excited about this moonshot, right? I remember sure. because when we worked together, there was a ton of energy and that was, that was great. Can you explain a little bit why you are excited about this particular moonshot? Why you think it's a great and important thing to do? Okay, thank you, Holger. I mean, I think the first thing is everybody sitting here. Uh, this meeting today is, in effect, the first time we have had a lot of people together to talk about the moonshot. And part of the goal of the moonshot was to bring a lot of people together. It was about the collaboration that we could develop. And it's a collaboration of... Um, not only just between robotics and AI, because that's, that is really important from my perspective and, and maybe also from others, but it's also the collaboration across the industry versus government. It's that triangle of research, industry, government that has to come together. And we've heard it time and time again this morning that the really important thing is that everybody gets together and works together to, to make sure that Europe actually um, is going to get an advantage of its own, not other people's advantage that it's borrowed, its own advantage in AI. And actually the real thing that really excites me about this is that I believe that Europe is actually probably the only place in, on the planet 
that is capable of pulling this off, uh, of getting that, that th three-way thing to work actually all together. Because you can see, obviously, in China, there's a very particular top-down political view. In America, it's become a very commercialized environment. In fact, it's, it's quite interesting to go back to the political history when NASA was formed, where there was a much bigger sort of public service element in, in the US. That's disappeared. So Europe really is in a unique place to be able to make the best out of AI, to serve both industry and citizen, to balance up the research. And as we've been, been hearing this morning, that balance between regulation and, and research and innovation is absolutely critical. So that's what really gets me going about this. Fantastic. Um, next to David is Anne Nowe, who is a professor of computer science and the director of the AI lab at the Freie Universität Brussels. So this is actually kind of a, you know, a home game for you. Yeah. Uh, you're very close to home. You're a former chair of the Belgian uh, Netherlands and I think also nowadays Luxembourgish uh, AI Association, mm -hmm. an important member um, of uh, your AI, an important member of the European family of AI associations. You are a former board member of URAI and have recently been elected as a URAI fellow. Congratulations, very well deserved, of course. Um, your research interests are in reinforcement learning and especially in multi-agent and multi-objective reinforcement learning. So I note that's not really what we associate with generative AI and we'll get back to that in a moment. You are co-leading um, the challenge on so-called situated AI uh, in, in the Flemish AI program, which is a program that I always admire because it's, you know, for a region like Flanders, which of course is important and economically um, very strong, but, but still just a region in Europe, it's a great effort. So you are one of the people shaping that effort, which is wonderful. Um, and also your team has developed novel algorithms for smart grids, communication networks, mechatronics, scheduling problems, and many other applications. Um, and I know from personal conversation with you that you very much, like others, um, strongly believe in the interplay between theory and application. So that's sort of another interesting boundary, which David, of course, partially um, straddles as well. And it's fantastic to have you here. What I'm wondering about is your primary expertise is not Gen AI, right? So you're, you're a world-leading expert on something a little different. Why are you excited about this moonshot that's about generative AI? I mean, is this really just generative AI that, that this moonshot covers, or is it in fact more? I think uh, it should definitely cover much more. Um, the history of, history of AI is short, but not that short. Huh? So we should actually look back at what we have seen maybe in the 80s, if you look at expert systems, we uh, easily noticed that just modeling the experts' knowledge uh, is, is also having its limits and bottlenecks, so we introduced learning there. But on the other hand, if you only have learning, and especially if you do learning in the wild, so in the open world, it can also drastically go wrong. So uh, I think we have to combo combine all these AI approaches, all these AI methodologies, to create a trustworthiness uh, that we also discussed. So, and that's something we did in the lab always, so to have all the different, I mean, we tried, of course, because we don't have an uh, infinite budget, but we also try to have uh, different profiles so that we can learn from each other and complement each other. So I think that's definitely what we should do in a moonshot uh, project as well. So you're really saying in order to have trustworthy generative models, we need more than current Gen AI. We need to draw definitely. from other areas of AI. That's, that's your yes, opinion. Yes, do not make the same mistakes over and over again. And, and uh, like I said, the history of AI is rather young, but uh, uh, old enough to learn from previous mistakes. One would certainly hope so, right? <laughs> Especially a day and age of machine learning. So um, we'll get to Andrea, of course, in a moment. But first, I'd like to talk a little bit about and then with Arlin, Arlin, Arlin Albu Schäfer. He's the director of the Institute of Robotics and Mechatronics uh, at the German Aerospace Center, DLR. Um, he obtained his doctorate from the Technical University of Munich, which is, of course, one of the leading places for AI in Germany and hence also in, in Europe. Uh, and Alin, you teach uh, and lead their robotics research. So you are at the heart, at your heart, a, a roboticist, right? Specializing in developing complex robot systems for safe human interaction in versatile environments. You lead research uh, focusing on sensor-based programming and control for applications ranging uh, across a broad um, range of, of applications, including space travel and uh, healthcare. That's really cool. And you're also the coordinator of the EU Robin EU Network of Excellence. So 
Arlene, what, what I'm wondering, um, why do you think trustworthy generative AI methods as per the moonshot, which of course you at least have been indirectly involved in through the robotics community, right? Why do you think is that particularly important for embodied AI and AI-based robotics? Yes, thank you. So um, we are actually several people from our network here. Uh, great uh, to see you all. We are 26 uh, academic partners and some industrial partners. Francesco is here. And uh, uh, we are looking there, uh, setting up a basis to, to transfer knowledge between robots. I mean, you uh, all mentioned in the introduction that we need to overcome the fragmentation of, uh, of our communities in Europe. We have great robotic companies, great robotics research. The question is, how do we get the big amount of data you need, especially for systems interacting in the real world? And this is at, uh, at, uh, close to my heart. And you mentioned one aspect, which is trustworthiness. The other aspect, which I found very exciting, and I'm happy that David brought in uh, um, robotics into it, is focusing not only on generative models which explain uh, or, or are used for language and, and images so on data from the computers, but on data from the real world, on intelligence machines acting on the real world. To put it bluntly, we always say we don't want an act GP, a chat GPT, but we want an act GPT, <laughs> right? So, uh, and, and this is, of course, a moving target. You mentioned our... Uh, uh, partners and competitors uh, move fast and they address the uh, trustworthiness aspects. They address also the interaction with the physical world. But just to give an example, we see how much more complex it is to address autonomous driving. Uh, in this case, not with foundation models, but with uh, other um, AI aspects. And the big difference when acting in the real world is uh, you can smile and laugh a little bit if ChatGPT is saying some silly things and hallucinating. You wouldn't laugh anymore if your car would do things like that, right? So uh, that's the point where you see what's the difference of applying those methodologies. And we are not at a point to apply them yet. And I agree that we need first to catch up and to have language models, translation, and so on. But I'm very happy that our project also targets at something which is not there yet, definitely. right? And this is acting in physical world. So you think from a robotics point of view, this is a grand challenge. This is not something that is easily solved within the next one or two years. No, it isn't. We have seen how much it has been invested by, by Google, by Waymo, in autonomous driving, and still you don't have reliable autonomous, uh, <laughs> autonomously driving cars, which shows how much more complex these challenges are. And uh, we have great robotics companies and research in Europe. Still, robotics is in a, in a still confined environment. And if you just look at, um, at Tesla, they mentioned that they think that the robotics market is much bigger than the car market, right? We all know the science fiction movies and can imagine and have seen in movies those robots which are ubiquitous, which would uh, you know, offer you coffee, uh, clean all over the places, work in factories. This is not happening today. Why? Because the intelligence is lacking at a level which to allow this, right? And I think that now we are at a point which this is feasible, but we need to do some major steps. And I think the moonshot is exactly the instrument to give us the environment and you know, the focus, but also the size to, to address such, uh, such, uh, such goals. Great. Next would have been Alastair Nolan from the OECD, who was here earlier, but unfortunately didn't feel well and had to leave again, for which he apologizes. That's very unfortunate because some of us who know Alastair know that he's a great person with very unique insights. So in some sense, his perspective is now missing. The good thing is that Alastair, um, in preparation for this panel, sent me already a few points. And um, I think we're next going to go to York, but I... If, if you don't mind, I would like to confront you with one of those points, um, which otherwise Alastair would have, would have done, right? Um, so, but first about Jörg, he's the president of the German AI Association, a leading figure in Germany's data and AI scene. Um, he's also a partner at the Alexander Tam uh, GmbH, so that's a, that's a company. Um, he founded Parstream, which was later acquired by Cisco. And he is a very well sought after as a speaker and media expert shaping industry discourse. It's great to have you here with us, Jörg. So with your Thank insights you. into industry 
and in particular maybe into the kind of industry that Alin just mentioned, right, where you know, perhaps things like a Tesla bot could have a major impact. Alistair says the adoption of AI techniques is low. Is that something that you see within your membership in Germany, for example? Would you say, indeed, it's still pretty low? It pretty much depends. Yeah. So we, we see a lot of, uh, and, and talking uh, based on my practice as, as consultant with Alexander Tam, we are working for a lot of large German corporations, and, and they are pretty well set up in the AI area. So they have their, their large teams, even with 100 or several hundred people. Um, and they're, they're doing quite exciting stuff yeah, in, 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 in the Gen AI space, in, in document processing, uh, developing chatbots, and, and all, all other areas. There, of course, is also still still room for for improve room for improvement, uh, but I, I think the biggest challenge is uh, the uh, the gap uh, towards the small and medium enterprises that is uh, getting bigger and bigger, yeah, because they don't have the resources and they are not even a, a, attractive for talent, yeah, because uh, the talent wants to work in. In, in, in larger teams, yeah? they want to exchange ideas and, and experiences, um, which they can do in larger teams and large corporations. But uh, we also get a lot of applicants uh, that had been working at, at SMEs yeah? in, a, in a one or two or three people team yeah? and told us, well, it, it's after one year, we, we were still working on the same handful of projects and it got boring and we didn't have the chance to exchange ideas so I think it's it's really a, a challenge and, and also a must and we have to find ways to enable also the SMEs to adopt uh, um, AI uh, because on the other hand they will probably be also even more affected by uh, the lack of, of resources that we are fa and, and lack of people that we are facing in the future. I think that is something that uh, isn't yet recognized enough and not mm -hmm. uh, isn't that taken enough seriously uh, even by uh, by politics um, and uh, we have to to uh, explain these to to the boards of uh, of large corporations but especially uh, SMEs and the family-driven uh, companies uh, in, in, in Germany especially, um, that there is a need uh, to go into this, yeah, to, uh, to develop strategies, to cope with the lack of resources, to apply AI to increase efficiency and productivity. Uh, otherwise, they will run into severe problems uh, within five or ten years at the latest. That makes good sense. And of course, the SMEs, they are important in Europe, right? I think, by the way, not only in Germany, but maybe particularly mm -hmm. there, right? So mm -hmm. I'm curious. I mean, some people think that, you know, nowadays they all use Word and Office and Excel. So why shouldn't they use, you know, American software for their AI needs and then just build great German products on this, for example? What, what's wrong with that picture? I don't think in general it, 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 it isn't any ring, anything wrong in, in, in using AI ba uh, US based software which we anyhow are doing uh, even despite of the AI area it's uh, the, the risk is being dependent on this software yeah? and uh, uh, on one hand uh, when we look at the maybe upcoming political situation yeah, uh, but also when it when it comes to negotiations, yeah, and and in, in regards to 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 license fees, uh, uh, to uh, the question uh, if uh, especially in the AI space, uh, um, um, wha wha a, a guy from the um, from a large uh, German corporation that was one of the first who adopted uh, uh, the open the open AI ChatGPT services by Microsoft, uh, and I was astonished how, how quickly this uh, this uh, was done by them uh, a year ago. But they said to me, "Okay, we have the power. We are so big, we can negotiate our agreements with with Microsoft. But all the other the, the smaller companies or a lot of other companies." 
cannot. Yeah? So they have to agree that Microsoft uses uh, the data that is, uh, that is entered into the system in order to, to further train their models. Yeah? And Microsoft has the power, either you do this or you know, we, we, cannot, we cannot help you. And, and this is, for example, one, uh, one area, and there might be in the future all different kinds of areas where, um, where we really will regret that we don't have alternatives uh, uh, in, in, in Europe, uh, in the whole cloud services uh, space, uh, but especially then on top of it in the AI space. Mm -hmm. So if I understand that correctly, you are very concerned as the president of the German AI Industry Association about this development, the situation we're in. Is that correct? Yeah, of course. And we're, we're talking uh, um, uh, about our members. Our, our, our members are all uh, AI-focused mm -hmm. uh, companies yeah, that are providing uh, some kind of services. And they are concerned as well because yeah, uh, I, I, I remember uh, the press uh, and the feedback after the last uh, uh, OpenAI developers conference. Yeah, some some headlines were stating, "Okay, this is this is the dead of uh, additional thousand uh, startups." Yeah, because the the, the services that were uh, developed throughout years by these startups, yeah, were with one stroke uh, covered by uh, by OpenAI and the newest version of, of ChatGPT and, right. and uh, became obsolete as a separate business model. So that perhaps is a disturbing vision of things to come. Speaking of vision and also the policy space that you mentioned, of course, Axel Voss talked a lot about. Um, Andrea, you are the director of research at CEPS, which is one of the biggest and oldest and most important uh, think tanks here in Brussels. Uh, you're a social scientist and a musician. Um, you're an adjunct professor at the European University Institute and a visiting professor at the College of Europe. You advise not only the European Commission, but also other organizations, including the OECD. Um, and you are on the board of Canonical, which is the company behind Ubuntu. So it's your job at SEPS to also think about the consequences, right, of doing things and not doing things at the European level. So. Of course, I was absolutely thrilled to hear only last week that SEPS decided to get behind this moonshot. I think that's um, fantastic. I see this personally as great validation of the work that people in e-robotics and Claire and, and others have done together. Tell me a little bit, you know, also having carefully listened to, to what was said around this little table, what makes you excited about this moonshot? Why is SEPS supporting this? Well, SEPS is supporting it because we believe it's important. Uh, we believe it's uh, embedding the way in which the EU can go about uh, important breakthroughs in innovation and, uh, and also bringing uh, results on the market, right? Uh, uh, and, uh, and changing the life of citizens. Uh, we are in a moment in which we see a lot of fragmentation. We see uh, problems in getting our act together to really um, uh, achieve the speed and the, and the momentum in research. Uh, but this doesn't mean that we consider that to be easy, of course, right? Uh, of course, I wouldn't be very original if I said we do it because it's difficult, because that's the original moonshot language by JFK, okay? But indeed, we have to do it. We have to do this in this orchestrated way because it's hard. And I think there are a few things that are missing and we need to work on them. So that's my, my contribution is a critical and supportive one. And the contribution of SAPS is a critical and supportive one. Um, why um, uh, supportive? I just said it. We believe that the way in which AI is going and the way in which AI is developing is not necessarily in line with the values and the principles that the EU stands for and that most of the European researchers pursue in their research. Why are we critical? Because we know it's complicated. First thing that you need in an exercise like this um, is political commitment and buy-in, right? I don't know how many EU institutions representatives are in the room. Are there some? No. Um, we well, have somebody from ESA if you want to count that and we'll no, hear no, but, later but about that's that. Important. So. that it, it's important that some institutional buy-in is there or we consider it to be still at the phase where we need to decide what we present to the EU institution. So I'm actually happy that they are not here. I think there are a few more things that we need to do together in order to be able to present something that concretely makes sense. Second thing, is the subject matter conducive to such an exercise? 
Probably yes, we see that the problem of, that the scale is very important in this, uh, in this domain. We observe data about who does what in AI uh, in Europe. This is the research that we are carrying out at SEPS. And uh, we see that there are perhaps four main hubs in AI in Europe. Uh, so you're you're going to all hate me because I'm not going to name your cities, but they are, if you look at venture capital publications and patents, if you wish, London, Paris, Munich, and Eindhoven. Okay, now everybody hates me. Uh, it doesn't mean that nobody, the others don't do anything. But we see also that they don't talk to each other. Okay, and so they are specialized in different things. They don't cooperate. Maybe Munich cooperates with Stanford more than it does with Eindhoven. Huh? And so, can we go on like this in a situation in which we would need to integrate our research paths? Okay, but is that all? No, it's not all this. We need something more which is we need to understand um, how to put our paths together. And uh, my question to you, which is my provocation, is to move from the uh, research funding and uh, ordinary research life into the moonshot mindset means adopting what we call a portfolio approach. Uh, a moonshot adopts a portfolio approach. You need to, and I remember talking to the head of engineering at ESA uh, um, a while ago, um, Tommaso Guidini, and he was telling me, I need to push my budget to the extent that 70% of my projects must fail, because otherwise I'm not pushing the goalpost <laughs> further enough. Are you ready for this? Are you ready to see your, your field of research lose because the overall organization of the motion has decided that that must terminate or must conflate with something else that will then potentially produce a result? It is a shift in mindset, so I'm, that's why I'm saying it is difficult. And I remember because many years ago, not that they really listened to me, but I've been a, 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 an advisor to DG Research and Innovation now for nine years. And nine years ago, uh, eight years ago, we wrote the uh, mm, blueprint for the governance of what today are called the missions, five missions in Horizon Europe. And um, you need a portfolio approach. You not only need the rotation, you need verifiable, concrete, ultimate results. Uh, landing on the moon and hopefully coming back safely is a binary thing, right? You can say yes or no. What you have said there, I know it's very complicated in terms of the European alternatives, but requires a lot of refinement, in my opinion, and we need to do it together. So it's good that there are no institutions there because once we push it, it has to be much clearer. And so I know you now say, you say please, can you uh, take back the endorsement because we don't want you there. <laughs> You're making our life difficult. But I remember, yeah, I mean, when, when Philip and I were in the high-level expert group on AI, uh, and you know, there were many, some of us here in the room that were there. Uh, I remember Philip already had involvement with Claire and uh, the idea of the CERN for AI. You were already working on this. If we want to really do it in a way that convinces you institutions, we need to really tick all these boxes properly. The experimental portfolio approach, the governance of it, the um, uh, lines of research that will be put together, the vocation towards um, uh, a real challenge-driven approach and mission-oriented approach. So letting some streams of research fail, unfortunately, and the idea of pushing the boundaries and the clear idea of what we want to achieve and where it should be achieved because it doesn't have to be a self-contained system, right? Uh, we still continue to cooperate with the US, with China in research. That's, the, that's a global uh, market for research, but where do we focus on the European solutions and alternatives? I think all this has to be in place. So the endorsement by SAPS, and I have two colleagues, Robert and Paula, who's gonna be also with us uh, the, the whole day and, and in this research, uh, is uh, an endorsement that means, yes, we cannot do it alone. Uh, you. Uh, are the ones that have the subject matter. We are here to help you tick all the boxes and help you talk to the policymakers for, to make this finally happen because we cannot wait any longer. And this, of course, is great. You know, I mean, we couldn't be happier to have you part of this um, because of the experience that you bring to the table in ticking the boxes and also, more importantly, defining what it takes to have all these people and, and organizations play together, right? I mean, as a musician, I wonder, you know, I'm a musician too, so I'm. I'm for me, the situation is a little bit like if you get a bunch of fabulous soloists together and you say, right, now you play together. And I think we both know that almost never works, right? No. So because, you know, there has to be somebody directing this. There needs to be a little bit more coordination. So perhaps that's something that we're missing here as well, right? And, and that we need to carefully set up. 
It's like the AI hubs, right? You are a musician, I'm a musician, but we never play together. So maybe next time. <laughs> there we go. Exactly, we should. <laughs> so I, 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 I want to get back to you. I mean, you know, Andrea said something very provocative there, which is, you know, we have to be willing to not only attempt things that then don't work out. I think you and I, as scientists, we do this all the time. Yeah. But we might also have to be prepared that if we really go for a moonshot, somebody will tell you or me or both of us what you're doing is actually not getting us closer to the moon right now, so maybe then somebody else gets more funding. Are we prepared to go there? Are you prepared to go there? To some extent, because I think it's a bit dangerous to uh, say that one um, line of research in AI um, mm. would need to die out. I mean, uh, that's a bit... It's a bit uh, an maybe extreme. Maybe that's not what yeah. you meant, but uh, <laughs> I, I fully agree with, with the failing, but that should also be part of, of the failing strategy that maybe something which looks now less promising. When I started to do reinforcement learning, there were not a lot of people believing in anything on reinforcement learning. We were playing in small grid worlds, and now we see uh, what has been uh, achieved by reinforcement learning. So suppose that in the 80s or the beginning of the 90s, people would have said to me, yeah, but reinforcement learning, you don't get any funding for that. Yeah, that would have been a missed opportunity, I would say. So with that having said, I think it's, it's okay to, to, to say you have to align to a certain goal, uh, maybe not so much a strategy, but, but to achieve something which is uh, interesting for Europe, to solve actually problems that we face in Europe. Absolutely. David, I'm curious, you also have a fair bit of experience sort of, you know, not only watching carefully what the Commission is doing and not doing in, in other bodies, right? but also directly advising them. So um, I think we've just heard Andrea say this is a tricky game. I think I've heard you say the same thing. Um, do you think with this moonshot we actually have a chance of playing this game well enough that things turn around in time for us to still have a chance to, to catch up here? Well, that, 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 that I think is sort of the $64 billion question um, <laughs> that we have to get right. Um, I think there are two factors here. The first is obviously we're in a transition period. We have a new commission turning up. We have new commissioners. We will have a new way of looking at things. And so I think we are, at a, as I've said to a number of people, we're at a sweet spot right now where, where influence can, can happen more rapidly uh, and can go from the bottom to the top more quickly. When you're in the middle of a commission which have set the objectives, trying to get stuff in at the bottom and make it move all the way up, it means to circulate through committees and goodness knows what. That's, that's much, much more difficult. Right now, we have an opportunity. But one of the things that we know is that the, the instruments the Commission has been using throughout certainly Horizon 2020 and now in Horizon Europe are actually in their own right incapable of, of either reacting fast enough. I mean, I, I used to be involved in Horizon 2020 and to a lesser extent now in Horizon Europe in, in constructing the work programs. You're, you're looking at almost a 10 year cycle. It, 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 the, from, the, from the point where the commission says we'd like to do something to the point when a, a, a work program gets published, it's two years, and then the work program takes a year to get out into the environment and get funded. And then there's a five year possibly time span before there's a project outcome. I mean, 10 years in AI, I mean, well, it's just not going to achieve a damn thing. So we actually have to also, alongside this, persuade the Commission, and I, in fact, I think it's not the Commission, it's Parliament too, and I think Axel Voss clearly today was talking to a certain extent about this, that we actually need completely different ways of doing things. Um, and part of the moonshot has always been rooted and in the conversations that we've had very early on in this was always about we cannot use the instruments that currently exist to do this. We need something completely and utterly different because actually part of the failure that we've seen has been because they've been using the instruments they know how to use. Mm -hmm. That's actually a big part of the problem. So while I'm, in, in, while I'm encouraged that we're at a point in time where we might have an influence... I'm also concerned that that influence has got to include the way that the Commission changes how it operates. And we've seen it with the AI Act, uh, we've seen it in, 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 in the way that it invests in short-term projects. I mean, we know in robotics in particular, you know, the technical complexities alone 
mean that it takes two, a, 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 an entire framework program or a framework program and a half from an idea to go from the lab bench to being at TRL 6 or 7 where it's potentially usable. And if you do that through a bunch of very fragmented work program calls, it's really difficult. Only particular people can actually follow that thing all the way through. We lose a lot of the talent and a lot of the expertise in the process. This is ridiculous. No wonder we're behind. So, Alin, I'm going to come to you. I mean, you're organizing one of these networks of excellence. I think we both know a fair bit about those because we've both been involved in, in different ones of them. This is one of these instruments that David is talking about, that the European Commission had at its um, disposal and used it. And you've heard me say earlier, I really believe not a single euro has been wasted, but that's maybe not getting this job done. And that's what David now said as well. With these kind of instruments, you know, maybe it's really sort of, you know, if, if you just have a, a quartet of tubas, you can't, you can't play a Mozart string quartet. <laughs> it's simply not going to work. So, so what do you think about that? Do you think they're right? Yes, I mean, first of all, I, I have to say that I really enjoy this, uh, this network of excellence by bringing, you know, really top research centers together, right? And uh, on the other side, we can just set the seeds for, for what we plan to do and what uh, is going to come, right? And when I'm talking about uh, robots acting in the wild, either outdoors or in our homes or in, in environments, right? We suddenly have the opportunity of uh, open world models, right? I mean, the ontologists promised to, to do some modeling of the world, they failed, right? Now you could imagine at least having a, a generative model, gathering the information from the internet about, I don't know, how to assemble your IKEA furniture or how to cook a certain dish, right? And, and generate code for your robot up to a point where, where you can deploy it. But this is a big vision. I mean, in our network now, we are trying to set up the instruments to collect those data among all these beautiful robots we have uh, all over in, uh, in Europe, including companies, including universities. Um, so, but this is just the starting point, preparing for something like, uh, like the Moonshot project, and then the project ends after four years. So when we set up the cloud infrastructure, the uh, joint software uh, infrastructure to have uh, consistent data, right? Getting all the people together, uh, we have the basis, and then the project will end, right? Which is an important step, but we need to do a follow-up, which gives you, you know, also, also the, the financial strength, the access to um, HPC uh, infrastructure, and then the opportunity to, to develop those components up to the deployment. So, in other words, you think there is sort of a problem with the, the strategy as it currently unfolds, which is basically fund research networks for four years and then fund new networks rather than having any chance of extending the old ones or making them the seeds for something truly bigger. Absolutely. That's a really big issue. And we are, in our network, very intensively discussing about how to move on on this. Right. And I think the moonshot is a fantastic opportunity because we can bring in all these things which have been set up and, and have something which is consistent over a period of time. And, and the other point is we have now nine of those networks of excellence. And I mean, having the, the vision coordination action which, which you are leading and which brought us together is already a good thing, but it's a, still a very loose interconnection of those networks, right? I mean, the fact that we are here is maybe an outcome of this, uh, 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 this coordination action, so it's, it's good already, right? But we need to go one or two more steps further. Couldn't agree more with that. Jörg, I'd like, I'd like to come back uh, to you briefly and maybe to something that I think you alluded to earlier. Um, w when we talked about, you know, industries throughout Europe, maybe for you it's easy to think about industry in Germany, but I'm sure you have contacts way beyond Germany and know how that works there. Um, you know, what is it actually that we would, that would get us into real problems not just in terms of technological sovereignty, but maybe also in the way these companies want and need to operate, right? So let's, let's take off the table this question of how much does it cost them and how dependent do they become? But do you think that the stuff that's currently made based on perhaps an American way of looking things and what comes to mind, of course, is the famous move things, move fast and break things, right? How does that sit with your members and members elsewhere in Europe, that companies elsewhere in Europe that want to use AI? Is, is move fast and break things? It's, is that an approach that, that will work well across the board in Europe, you think? 
it should ideally yeah so but but there are a lot of obstacles yeah so I always wonder if something such a success story like open AI would have been possible in in in, in Europe uh, that uh, there is a smart team and there are some investors that are spending spending billions of dollars into that team uh, without any clear purpose as far as I know yeah we don't know what what uh, if there were any hidden agendas uh, but they just started as not for profit company and they 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 did some research and and finally they changed the world yeah and uh, uh, this is on, on one hand fascinating and on one hand frustrating that uh, we even so far couldn't imagine that something like this would would work in in, in Europe yeah uh, neither from the from uh, the uh, uh, the economy uh, nor from from the um, uh, from the governments and and the EU and, and and the funding so we we really should think more deeply about what makes these approaches so successful and what do we have to change uh, also in, in, in our funding strategies in order to, to get more into this. Yeah? I'm, I'm still looking for the, for the paper, the efficiency of the European funding in, in regards to, to economical outcome uh, in comparison to other regions. Yeah? I, if someone knows such a paper, I'm, I'm deeply interested in, in, in reading such a thing. And, uh, I think in, 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 in general, on, on, for example, on this side, we, 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 we should just rethink and, and learn from others and figure out that uh, the approaches that we are still already have since years, yeah, and they haven't been questioned since years, we have probably have to change this. And maybe this is also something that with a new commission could be set on the table. Yeah, let's let's think about all the bu bureaucratic hurdles and all the legal uh, uh, legal stuff that uh, you that uh, you, people who, are, who want to do research and want to develop, develop stuff are facing. And let's really think what helps them and and how we can be more efficient. Uh, as well as, on the other hand, in, 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 in the economy, the relationships uh, between startups and, uh, uh, and, and, and customers. Yeah? This, is, uh, this is one of the biggest uh, challenges uh, that uh, uh, startups and, and new technologies in the startup scene are facing as well. And so on one hand, it's, it's talent, okay, it's, it's uh, uh, getting cap venture capital. Uh, but uh, even with, with my startup, when we developed a, a, a database technology, yeah, we didn't find customers in Europe. We got requests from, uh, from Taiwan, from Australia, from the US, uh, but uh, uh, no companies from Europe, yeah, because they were so stuck and, and risk averse and uh, risk averse and then stuck with the existing technologies. Uh, uh, that we didn't have a chance, and we had to move to the U.S. And this is this is, was ten years ago, and this is still the case. So we'll get to you in a second, Alin. But but risk averse is exactly what I thought I would I would ultimately hear. So thanks for mentioning this. <laughs> it so took when, some time. W when I said the move fast <laughs> and break things, what I'm really wondering is, do you think, for instance, a European car manufacturer would have rolled out autopilot the way Tesla did, in terms of just making the decision, seeing what the system can and cannot do, to say? We're going to put this on the road. Let's just roll it out. Do you think a European company would have done it? Not at all, yeah, because they, yeah, they are risk averse. Well, well, on the other hand, uh, Elon Musk is a, is a special risk taking guy. <laughs> so so this, this is really an extreme. Uh, uh, but. Um, but you know, maybe yeah, yeah. But, but maybe but citizens in Europe also would, wouldn't want in, that, right? In, in, in this case, yeah, uh, Amazon wouldn't have been possible in, in, in Europe because Jeff Bezos was able to tell the, his investors for over a decade, yeah, yeah, we don't make profit, we are growing, yeah, wait till the profit comes, yeah, yeah? and this this wouldn't have been possible with. Uh, uh, a European company, a uh, public company, anywhere, because at least after after three, four years, the investors say, "Okay, now we will see profit. Yeah, we, we don't want to grow anymore. We, we will see profit right now." 
Yeah, yeah, I get your point. Ali, you wanted to also respond to something that yes, you said. Yes, yes, yes. I, I wanted to add uh, a little bit of an optimistic perspective from, uh, from robotics. Um, mm. From what the European Union has funded, actually a lot of companies emerged, right? And uh, especially, I mean, looking at robotics, there's a clear trend. 20 years ago, robots has been behind fences. Right, the rules were whenever a human approaches, everything has to stop. Mm -hmm. Now we have the uh, trustworthy, well, let's put it like this, safe robots which are interacting with humans. This is a technology which has been funded by the European Union for about 20 years, and it's out there, and there are companies, right? And uh, there are several companies, unfortunately, where they need, a, where they reach a size of, uh, of a unicorn, of a billion or so, they are very often acquired by, uh, by American investors. Mm -hmm. But they are very strong. I mean, we were talking today about uh, 1X in Norway, because we are here in the Norway house. They just put on, on, uh, on YouTube a fantastic video using AI with uh, 15 humanoid robots on the internet. I mean, you are still in Europe and doing well, and I hope you will get soon a unicorn. But that's a great example. Uh, we have some startups from DLR, uh, which uh, agile robots, they have agility in their name. They are also in the size of, I don't know, one and a half billion. So we have the companies. The point is they are strong on the mechatronics, on the interaction, and so on. So now is the point where it will be decided if those companies make the jump to, to, you know, to build those robots which are everywhere, which you see in science fiction movies, or if they won't. So now it's the time. We have the spaces, right? It's not that we don't have them, right? But we need to do the next step very quickly. Otherwise, we will waste those resources or maybe not exploit their opportunities and chances the way we could. So I think we should take the chance and we have a great basis. So I think that's very consistent with what David also said just a moment ago. You know, now is the window of opportunity. We, we need to go and do this. And, and as it happens, now is also a good time for doing that. And yeah, what, what do you think about this? Is now the right time to do this and to push aggressively on that? Yeah, I have a couple of thoughts on this. First of all, you're, I agree that it's a good window of opportunity for also other reasons. Uh, not only we are in a political transition, but during this political transition, the next framework, 10th framework program is being decided, right? The so-called HATOR group inside DG Research and Innovation is in charge of doing the interim evaluation of Horizon Europe and charting the path for what could potentially be a radically different approach. But, you know, we are all path dependent, especially in the European institutions. So it's very difficult to imagine, unless someone pushes for it, a radical, a radically different framework program going forward. Who has an interest, if not us, okay, in proposing something like this? Uh, and that's important. Second thing, figures wide, uh, uh, wise, um, I'm, I've sent you a couple of papers, uh, but certainly one thing that, <laughs> then, then, um, uh, that, that I can say is that when it comes to venture capital, for example, uh, what we find in the EU market uh, compared to other markets, we find roughly the US to attract 61% crunch-based data uh, of venture capital funds. The China, if I remember correctly, 17%, Europe 6%. But then when you look at the researchers, the leading researchers that come out of Europe, we're actually very close and actually over the US, above the US. So in this flow on, the, on other parts of the world is in the figures and then the numbers as well. Do you want to wait for Europe to become a move fast and break things uh, uh, continent to, to achieve the moonshot? This is a Saturn landing, it's not a moonshot, okay? <laughs> uh, so my, there are different things. There is an old saying um, that I like to quote every now and then, so for, uh, forgive me, my, my colleagues, if you already heard me say that, because I like it a lot, which is, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. I think right. Europe has potentially the approach of going far together, for example, understanding that you don't squeeze out of generative AI everything that you have without having the longer term idea that maybe other techniques will come to the rescue. And so the future of AI is a blending of techniques, right? Like, like many scholars argue, the US is relatively short term and opportunistic in this. We can do better if we get our act together. If we don't get our act together, we actually the worst version of the US, fragmented and inefficient. They are fragmented and efficient. We have to be collegial and effective. That sounds absolutely great. Um, I, I also feel that um, 
you know, in a sense, we are already starting to be good at this, but we're, we're not good enough at yet, right? So, so there is definitely potential. And, and maybe I'd, I'd like to, to close with you because I see that they're already preparing things for our coffee break, and I think uh, everybody will appreciate that and a little bit more opportunity to talk to each other. That's also very important. Talking about but, human but rights. Exactly. But, but Anne, first of all, uh, let me ask you this question maybe at the closing here. Um, you are one of Europe's leading AI researchers. You have a lot of students that have become very valuable to the sort of companies that we're talking about in Europe and beyond. You have a lot of female students, which is a traditionally underrepresented group within computer science and AI in particular. So particularly thinking of, of them, what do you think would need to happen to get them really excited about sort of, you know, staying in Europe, committing fully to, to having their career in Europe, to doing things here? What would need to change to really make it easy for them to say, this is what I want, right? Regardless of what somebody somewhere else would, would uh, be able to offer to me. I think that's a difficult question, but maybe one element is, uh, I'm now teaching a course, Roots of AI. So we really read old papers to show to the students that one, AI is not new, uh, so that you see that the seeds were already planted in the <laughs> 70s, the 80s, uh, but also from European researchers. Uh, so I also pay attention to select those. Um, of course, it has to be representative, but um, uh, I also show uh, movies of, of European researchers to, to say, and now these people are in the States, but they used to be in Europe. Uh, so I think that's, that's also important, specifically for female I find this a difficult question because, to be honest, I never asked myself the question if I would enter the um, auditorium the first day, whether I would meet fellow female students or just male students. I couldn't care less. Huh? So I also tried to convey that message. Huh? I never felt unwelcome in the AI community. I think we're doing a great job if it comes to conferences to pay attention to this uh, even more than in the past. Um, but then maybe a bit of a stereotypical typical, uh, answer is, yeah, the, the projects we are working on. Uh, so I hear a lot from female um, students. It, it has to matter what they're doing. It has to be for humanity. Uh, so then I would say, yeah, definitely don't go to these big tech companies, uh, but try to work on projects that will make a difference for Europe. And that's then maybe energy uh, issues with water, whatever, epidemics. That's where you can see the difference, I would say. So then that would lead to advice to the Commission, you know, make it worthwhile making a difference for Europe, make it possible to make a difference for yeah. Europe working in a research lab like yours, right? <laughs> Which already makes a difference, of course, but it could be a much bigger difference with more resources and a bigger network yeah. and being part of something yeah, bigger, the wouldn't it? Domain experts, so that they're then maybe more Excellent. balanced in gender and, and other backgrounds. Yeah. Exactly. So in terms of doing more things together, you think this vision of doing things together towards a common goal might in fact be appealing for the very students that you are yeah. trying to produce, male, female, whatever, right? Yeah. Great. So. We could continue on here, and I think it would be interesting for us, certainly, hopefully also interesting for you, but uh, I think coffee is served. Um, we're going to take a 18-minute coffee, coffee break and then go to our third session, which will be another panel about the implementation of the moonshot. We started to allude to this a little bit here, but we have another group of experts that have been specifically thinking about that. Meanwhile, let me very much thank David, Andrea, Anne, Jörg and Arlene in no particular order whatsoever. It's been great sitting here with you and hearing your uh, enlightened thought on this. Um, and I really like the idea, the spirit of we, we need to do this together. We need to make a difference for Europe and we need to make others understand that now is the time to make that difference. So thank you very much for being part of it. Thank you.